I'm thrilled and proud to be able to present uh, not only one, but two major pharmaceutical companies from the region. Uh, we have Novo Nordisk with Anu Balendran, and we also have Tara Heitner from Faring Pharmaceuticals. A warm welcome to them. Uh, and I should also say that, uh, Anu, your title, uh, your titles are very long. Uh, Anu, Senior Licensing Director, Global Business Development with Novo Nordisk, and uh, Tara, Head of Global Search and Alliance Management from Faring Pharmaceuticals. Uh, could you each give us a short summary of your, well, your background in BD and perhaps uh, tell us a little bit about your current roles? Uh, we can start with the ladies. Thank you, Jonas. Well, my background. Um, I'm a scientist by training, uh, and I worked for the first half of my career as a bench scientist doing drug discovery and development. Um, uh, but I very quickly uh, started uh, my entrepreneur career with the first spin out from MIT, which I w where I was a scientist. And then when I moved to Denmark, the founding uh, of um, a, a biotech startup that where I was also a scientist. When the company was ready for uh, commercialization, I took on the BD role and I did an MBA at DTU. And from then on, I have been working as a consultant in my own firm for ma many uh, companies in the region, both Sweden, Denmark, as well as in the rest of Europe. More recently, I was consulting for Merck, uh, German Merck, um, and for many uh, startups in the region. And I've been CEO of three companies, two of which I founded or co-founded, and a Swedish company here in the region. So my experience in BD comes from both working as director of business development in multiple startups and as CEO for, um, for some early stage companies. Great, thank you very much. And uh, your current role at uh, Faring Pharmaceuticals, you're actually uh, quite new at that role, is that correct? Yes, I started at Faring about two months ago and I'm um, now embarking on something new because I'm actually looking for opportunities and managing opportunities in the commercial, so drugs that are on the market or close to the market, and uh, in new therapeutic areas as well. Okay. Very exciting. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Anu, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your role at NOVA. Thanks, Jan. It's great being here. I'm also a scientist by training, and me and Tara were just comparing notes before I started, after my PhD, straight into a pharmaceutical company. I joined AstraZeneca up in Gothenburg and been with AZ almost 17 years as a science, Ben scientist through the drug discovery process, leading projects into clinic, and also then moving into business development in, in AstraZeneca, so learning the ropes within the big pharma environment. and you know the, These big companies do have lots of opportunities for you to try out different things. Then I stayed in BD with them for quite a while, and then with Alligator for two years. So some experience of working in the small biotech environment, a real kind of eye-opener for me, taught me a lot. And then back into Novo, I joined Novo three years ago. Um, and my, in my current role, I'm part of a small group, about 10, 12 people uh, within global business development in Novo, who are responsible for the transaction part, so very much uh, how to structure a collaboration, a deal with an external partner, uh, the agreements, the valuation, and, and then negotiation and completion of those deals. So we kind of don't go and search. There's great teams in Nova who do that, but more execute these uh, agreements. And I've been doing that for three years. But my basis is science, so I really enjoy looking at the scientific part of these collaborations. That's great. Uh, since you have uh, you have your uh, scientist, scientist backgrounds, and uh, do you have a specific uh, favorite therapeutic area that you both are uh, especially keen on, or do you are you agnostic, so to speak, in your roles currently? Anu, for example. So personally, I did my PhD on insulin signaling, and to work for Novo as an insulin company, diabetes is my kind of my favorite uh, area. I think. However, when it comes to Novo Nordisk as a company, I mean, of course, we are in the news today. Our history is diabetes and obesity. Still, it's very much our co-therapeutic area, so we're really out looking for partnerships in, in those two areas. So 
But however, Novo is also expanding its portfolio of projects to adjacencies to diabetes and obesity. So we're looking at cardiovascular disease. You will see some of the deals we've done around that. You'll see in our partnering page, we're keen on new cardiovascular opportunities. We're also looking at some NASH and, uh, and also chronic kidney disease. Novo has a legacy in rare blood disorders and rare endocrine disorders, and we still continue to you know, give focus to uh, programs in rare blood disorders. Uh, for last year, we uh, acquired a company in sickle cell disease, so we are keen to move therapies in, that, in rare blood disorders and also some rare endocrine disorders. Hmm. And what about you, Tara? Do you have a favorite area that you are? Uh, that's at? a very tricky question. Um, Diseases are very difficult to have uh, favorites for, uh, as you know. <laughs> Maybe it's a poor choice of words. But um, I've worked in my career, because of my consultancy um, company, I've worked across indications, therapeutic areas, and modalities. Um, but where I focus the most has been in autoimmune diseases and inflammation. And as most of you probably know who work in science, most diseases, there is always an underpinning of the immune system in almost all diseases, including diabetes. So that, um, you know, this is, I, I really, from a scientific perspective, if I could do it all over again, <laughs> I would not have done a PhD in chemistry. I would have done a PhD in immunology. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Uh, and this is a broad question, but I would like you to try to narrow it down to uh, one one specific answer, if possible. Do you have any personal reflections on current business development trends or licensing trends? Is there anything in particular that you could put your finger on? If I start with you, Anu. I, I believe there is an increase in focus in therapy areas of interest to know, you know, in the metabolic space. It's been uh, a neglected space in investment for a long time, but. Given the excitement and the success that's been shown, we can see an increase in uh, interest from investors and so forth in, in going into that space. Is that something you share, or do you have any other reflections on that? Uh, well, I think there's a, a very interesting trend towards personalized medicine, and I think even though I've been a very short time at Faring, there seems to be a, a di uh, interest in going that direction, even for uh, fertility and, and women's health. Also, the trend towards um, um, point of care, home care, hospital home care, so that you can take the patient out of the clinic, out of the hospital, and treat them at home with advanced devices and apps to monitor, to do test blood, and to, um, to even look at, you know, the, the status of the ovaries and whether, the, you know, the fertility drugs are working and when to stimulate. So um, now that I've joined Faring, I've really um, seen that there is um, an underrepresentation, underfunding of women's health, and and of really um, underrepresentation of uh, scientific understanding about fertility. So I think that that's a, a real strong new passion of mine. Mm. And then uh, representing two well truly global players, uh, do you still think that your respective companies, being here in the region with their headquarters and so on, have a especially keen eye on the Nordic uh, scene, so to speak, S um, specifically Swedish or Danish companies? When you look to what what to what you could acquire or uh, find next, Tara. <laughs> Uh, well, obviously in the Nordics there's extremely good science and I think at uh, Faring we have a collaboration with several um, early um, uh, academic groups, including Karolinska. So indeed we are looking to the Nordics. We also have a collaboration with the BII Institute uh, in Denmark. So there is a clear um, un you know, value of the research and the science that's going on in the Nordics. Mm. And what's, uh, what's the Novo Nordisk uh, take on that? I mean, very much like what Tara has been saying. I think, um, you know, we are, I, I'd like to add on to say, like, if you take a company like Novo, I think it's, it's a duty of us to look globally. So we do look globally. That's, that's part of the claim. And it's important that companies in the Nordics are competing globally. And I know you guys see the world as your partnering opportunity. 
But being close to home here in the Copenhagen, of course, we have a, an increased chance of interacting with the companies in the region and, and following them a bit more closely. And as Tara mentioned, like the BII in, in Denmark, we, we do work closely with the academic groups here across the region, and that gives us a bit more, uh, maybe a step forward in the relationship with, in, in, our, in the area to develop those into partnerships. Hmm. Uh, I should <clears throat> also mention that I can see that here in the in the question app there are some questions coming in and that's great. Uh, I would just say that encourage everyone to write whatever questions you might have for these giants on stage and uh, I will be happy to relay them when we are done. So, uh, so looking at different assets or different potential assets, what is it? What's the most attractive thing that you look at uh, when you when you assess a potential target? Tara. Uh, well, Vering has a a, str um, a cultural focus on um, putting people first, so the patient really comes first, and because our main focus is on um, fertility and maternal health, um, we're definitely focused on any uh, technologies that will complement our current approaches and uh, allow us to uh, reach a larger market. Yeah. And what, what do you have your focus on when you, when you explore? So I'm going to stretch the question a bit, Jonas, and give you a little bit of feel for how we do evaluations in Novo. Maybe that yeah, answer, please do, please answers do. the question a bit more. So, I think the, spoke about the disease areas of focus, and then comes from from how we approach partnering and how we look at external partnerships. We have a really close team within global business development at Nova Nordisk, and we start with our strategy. So what we are out looking for has a strategic link to within our company and the different therapeutic areas within our company. They are in close connection with those leaders in those therapeutic areas to understand where is the gap. Because please understand, we also have a very strong uh, internal R&D engine, which is also producing uh, pr uh, drugs for us. So we need to fit it in. So based on those strategies, we're going out and looking for uh, uh, programs. And that can be at different stages. And that will determine what we want in those programs. What we're looking for, I mean, maybe it's a cliche, but it's true. We're looking for pharma quality across. So, you know, there's got to be a clear focus on what it brings as a differentiating uh, feature to the medical, unmet medical need. As Tara was saying, the focus on patients, making a difference to patients, that has to be there for why you're doing that. Then comes exactly the whole aspect of the quality determined on where you are in the stage. We're looking for that you know, programs that will be easier for us to integrate into a pipeline. And that means you've kind of done the whole package to a pharma quality. It might be more expensive, a bit more extensive work in safety and all the other aspects, but that's what we will look for in everything and quite detailed diligence going through the process. So our teams are doing through evaluation and then going through diligence in detail and, and it can be across multiple parameters that that makes a click. Mm. And uh, we're actually going to dive into the, the, the pricing or value uh, part of it also in a little while. But uh, seeing that, are there any obvious red flags that would immediately disqualify uh, a small company for, from a potential partnership? Uh, I mean, perhaps the due diligence team should be here to answer that, but I'm sure you have your ideas about what could be a possible no-go zone, so to speak. If I ask, start with you, Tara. Well, as a scientist or former scientist, data is king. And so um, strong scientific package, good clinical data, strongly powered clinical trials with clear endpoints that are meaningful, that are well recognized by the KOLs, that'll be uh, important. For us, of course, it has to meet our strategic areas of focus. Uh, at uh, a force for fairing um, and uh, support our you know our global strategy we have a global footprint and um, we're looking at assets not just for the US market but across the globe both in Asia and South America and Africa as well 
as well as Canada. So um, a no-go would be, uh, you know, for example, poor patent situation, short uh, exclusivity period, or um, poor, poor data package that's not supported. Mm. Is there anything you might add Anna, to that? I think you've covered some of the key aspects when it comes to patent and so forth. There's, you couldn't pinpoint to one. I think in a due diligence, I've, been, I've led so many, you can fall at any point, you know. And I think that's the important part for us to turn every stone and understand the two full data package. What is important, as Tara was saying, is a good, strong scientific data package uh, that is significant and that can support the rationale for developing that drug. And both of you have also background in working with smaller companies and sort of being on the other side of that table during BD discussions, I guess. So is there anything that you have learned now in the big pharma environment that you wish you had known before when you were at a smaller company? Sarah? Oh, there's a lot of things I wish I would have known. Um, but I think that um, it's been difficult when you were uh, when you were a smaller company to really be able to deliver everything. Pharma companies will always say, "We want more data. We want more data. We want more data." So, the key is to be able to tell the story with strong but limited data. You can only generate so much as a small company. You can't run the same clinical trial as a big pharma, but it's important to run a good, cl solid clinical trial, even though you may not have the right funding, and, you, and you, you can support your clinical data with external data from other parties. So for example, um, pharma would, if you say you have a novel target, that's great, but pharma will often not want to partner just because you have a novel target. They want to see that that target is validated by other people, other pharmaceutical companies that might be following the target, or other well-established um, academic groups that are publishing around the target. So. If you have a novel target, make sure that other people think it's novel as well. Mm. Is that a little bit of a following in the herd mentality then? You want to be competitive, but not too unique. <laughs> <laughs> Anu? I mean, I think I went from having spent 17 years plus at AZ to a small biotech. And I would think starting there, people at Alligator at that time would have said, God, this guy wants everything under the sun, which is true, as just Tara says. I think from a big pharma perspective, there, there is a real wish for a big data package. You know, they really want to see these projects coming to the pipeline with the same level of you know, scrutiny and data as they would do for their own programs. And, and that's natural. And I think it's important here to, to really focus on the key elements and create that right value out of this package, which in a lot of companies, for me, one of the things is it's going to cost more than you think. You can't do things on the cheap. That's, I have to be honest, is you got to make sure you can focus your investments in the company to get to the full package. And the, you cut short, you're going to suffer when you're showing that data package in a, in a deal diligence. So that it's really important to think way ahead of you coming to a point where you say, I want a licensing partner, that you've thought through what would the licensing partner want in this package of data, and make sure you're creating that full uh, chain there and, and creating the value out of it. Mm -hmm. And you touched upon the, 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 the cost side of it, and that's pretty much in focus now for many, many small companies, obviously seeing as it's tough to raise capital. Um, would you say that, in general, the current market climate then will have to get capital and uh, is that driving more deals, BD deals or licensing deals or uh, acquisitions um, because of lower valuations and uh, well, the perhaps more desperate feeling about small companies that they need to get uh, some kind of funding. Would you say that, Tara? Uh, I think there are definitely more programs out there available to, for partnering, but because of the lack of funding, pharma companies also have to be have a lot more scrutiny because the the data isn't there because the company haven't haven't been funded enough. So um, while there are many projects out there 
they maybe lack the data packages that we would seek in a pharma company to in license. It doesn't mean we wouldn't follow them to see if that could be done or be creative around some kind of research collaboration to see the data package be completed through that type of collaboration. So I think you have to be creative in these days on how to get the data needed. Mm. So it's bargain, a bargain price tag. Is that even an issue for a big pharma company, really? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you would think so. But from where we stand, when where we find a program that is interesting and attractive to us. It's also something that's good and has a value. So then you, you are going to pay the value. And it's not, the, of course, there is maybe more of a press for partnering compared to maybe a time when you can raise capital and keep it going for longer. So they'll partner earlier. But I think we will pay the value that it, it demands because of the quality and the innovation in it. Um, and it's, you know, it's not purely market driven. So the market has some play, but I think we are in our own cycles where we are keen to do a deal or have a strategic outlook to do deals, then you know, I think we'll, pharma companies are stepping in. I mean, you're not seeing on a global scale, yeah, it, it, there are deals happening, but there's also big price tags. I, I, don't, I can't say from looking at it that I'm seeing a massive depreciation in the ta price tag for this. I think they all drive a certain value based on the quality where they have gone and maybe the demand for that from several partners, that'll drive the price. Hmm. Well, that's a really interesting, and it's actually leading into my next question. That what, is, what are the driving factors behind the, the different price tags? I mean, obviously you have pa patient population and, and stuff like that, market potential, but um, what's, what's the huge difference that makes, uh, uh, for example, Roche pay uh, 7.1 billion US dollars for, for, for Televant uh, when they buy them. Uh, and, and another company gets a 300 million upfront, or, and then perhaps a smaller company gets only 30 million upfront. I mean, there's huge differences there. Is it all data driven, you think? I, know. I, I think what you will see when you look at these price tags, there is a correlation to how late stage it is and also linked to how big a market potential it has. So there is, I mean, all of our peers and including us are doing diligent financial modeling to, to, to put a valuation on, on these programs. So that, that I think is probably a large part of how the pricing is based on the programs. Um, but there is, and the other element of it as well is, you know, uh, novelty, maybe there's a premium paid for that. I mean, you're first in class or, you, you know, so forth. Then there's competition as well. If there is a true competition for a certain asset, then of course that can also have an influence on the price. Mm. But mo most of it is driven by the potential it presents and how the team can justify that. Mm. So, uh, as we were saying here, the, the bargain price tag might not be a game changer for a company uh, of the size of Novo or Fering to do an acquisition or not, but everyone loves a bargain. So, do you think that the current market climate can make even the companies that have something that's desirable from a big pharma's perspective to be, you know, more vulnerable in the negotiation situation regarding how much they can get paid? Do you think so, Dar? I think it's important to know the value of your asset, even in the market we're in today. Um, it's important to build, build relationships with the company that you're partnering with and not expect you're going to make a deal in, in a month or two. It takes anywhere between 12 to 18 months. During that time, you build a relationship. In the company you speak to, you should have an internal champion. That's important in terms of the, you know, you're not you know, negotiating um, to, for the, the cheapest deal. You're negotiating for a long-term relationship. And if you, if you have finances that don't support a long-term relationship, then the deal, the alliance will not be a success. Um, and I also agree that you want to have a competitive process. So ideally, more than one company is bidding for your asset, and that's an important aspect in the, uh, in the process. Mm. That's a dream scenario, I guess, to have many bidders. Uh, so. 
Well, what would be your best advice then to a smaller company looking for a license deal or to even be acquired at some point? Um, how do you maximize attraction from companies like yours? I think it's important to start the partnering process and engaging with pharma companies early to learn what it is they expect. And uh, before you actually make the clinical trial design final, make sure that you're aligning with what the market expectations are for what the clinical trial should be, what the endpoint should be, how it should be powered. Um, and then make sure that you engage continuously along the way with all the partners so that you build this relationship and engage with them. When you're ready to make the deal, you will already have engaged people who are willing to hear about your program. And given, given the, the, the magnitude of the, <laughs> the global market and, and so many projects out there, uh, can you get the big pharma's attention at, at that an early point? What do you say, Anu? Uh, adding on to Tara, I mean, plan early. And to your point, can you get the big farmers' attention? Yes and no. I think it depends on the disease area you're in. And, and, and if you had a scientific target with novelty, maybe they will just be curious. So that's a part of the first part of you to engage with them in partnering meetings is actually showing that you have a differentiated approach to this, that will create the willingness to talk to you. I think anything like a, I'm doing the same thing that was done 10 years ago, similar to everything else, is dif not differentiated. You're not going to get their attention. It, it's a tough world out there. So that's a way to get engagement. But then I also believe there are a lot of professionals who have ex pharma experience. I think you need to get hold of those experts out there and consultants and you know, engage them, have the conversations, get their help to, to partly design your programs going forward. So you're building a product that's right for licensing, not a product that you think is great. I think, I mean, I'm being blunt here. I think you need to really put yourself and get that advice from a customer per perspective to make sure you're building it. But Great if you can engage pharma, but also you know, think about getting hold of people who have the experience who can give you that advice. Hmm. Well, um, you can feel free to provide some of that concrete advice. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, relay a few questions from the audience because I think they are, frankly, better than mine. Um, so does it help to generate a lot of exploratory outcome data from trials to try and maximize their output? Is that type of data valuable in your assessment? What do you think, Tara? I'm not sure what you mean by exploratory. Do you mean like uh, single arm clinical trials? <laughs> I, I wish I could uh, speak for one person if, who asked. I mean, I think it's good for internal purposes to run some single arm. And in some indications, there are ways to run that. But you want to have a, you know, ideally double blinded, uh, you know, placebo-controlled trial, if if possible, because it, you're, I think it's ju you're just losing time and patent uh, exclusivity if you run a lot of trials that can't be used to move on in the uh, development process. So don't don't uh, create data for data's own sake. What do you think about that, Anna? Absolutely, I think, yeah, which will, as Tara says, I mean, to extend and kind of extend the life of the de clinical development. But what I want to add is if you have got a good design, if you mint exploratory is kind of maximize the data that you can measure out of a study in terms of having the samples, measuring biomarkers, as mentioned, you know, in towards personalized healthcare. Proof of mechanism in a trial, not just the endpoint, the disease endpoint. If you can create that additional data that really explains the science behind why you got that efficacy readout, that I think, if you think that is exploratory, that I think is very supportive. But you know, be careful on not doing trials just to collect, or in multiple diseases, I'll try lots of them, but I think you need to strategically pick the key disease your drug will work on, focus on that, a proper trial, and get as much data out of it. That's great advice. I see time is really running out, so I'm gonna end with one final question, and, and that's also on the practical side. Um, 
get big farmers' attention, connect with them early, and so on. So, to get connected with you guys, uh, what can a company here that's interested in partnering do apart from you know hitting you up next to the coffee machine in the break? Uh, well, Faring and myself and my colleagues were at many of the uh, of the therapeutic area conferences, scientific conferences, commercial conferences and also partnering meetings. Um, I think we also have a link on our website where we can be reached. Mm -hmm. Great. Anu? Yeah, I think it's, it is tough. I mean, it, and depends on the disease area. If you're in oncology, it is probably the toughest because knowing my colleagues in other pharma, they're receiving thousands of requests in each of these partnering stuff. So it's important. I think my, when I was thinking back on my time in biotech, recognize who are the key customers you have and and then focus on them from a longer perspective so you need to reach out them in partnering meetings you know scientific presentations at scientific meetings making sure your scientists go out and connect that's also a way to get engagement so the more you can get engagement in in the companies that are focused i mean there's not a lot of big pharma so you can be focused and recognize who are the right ones for you you, you need to really shape up how you communicate with them and make sure the content and the approach is good. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for the advice. Uh, there were a few more questions here, but uh, I would advise you to catch these guys in the break then, uh, the upcoming break, and ask them yourselves. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming today. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you.